All right. Good morning, everybody, or good afternoon. Uh, this is Jeffrey Harris, and you're listening to the 411 Wrestling Interviews Podcast. I'm speaking to the one and only, the legend, the murder hawk, Lance Archer. He is the IWGP United States Heavyweight Champion, and he has one of the biggest matches of all time coming up uh, on Wrestle Kingdom weekend. You are going to be facing the Death Rider, John Moxley. Uh, Lance, this is a huge matchup. This is this is like the stuff that wrestling fans dream of. How are you feeling going into Wrestle Kingdom 14, where it's likely you'll be facing uh, two two of the biggest matches of your career? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I'm I'm excited for it in every single way. You know, I've had a, a long, amazing history with New Japan. Um, you know, this is my sixth. Uh, Wrestle King to go and be a part of, <clears throat> and uh, actually it'll be my fourth time to defend a title. The three other times were with uh, Davy Boy Smith Jr. when we were the uh, IWGP Tag Team Champions, but this is my first singles championship and my first singles championship defense in the Tokyo Dome, so it's it's really exciting, and the fact that I get to do it twice uh, is even more exciting. Not only are you in a singles titles match at uh, Wrestle Kingdom 14, you're facing right. John Moxley, a former yep. WWE World Heavyweight Champion, and not only that, you're facing him in a Texas Death Match. Is is this the stuff like you dream of when you start a career in pro wrestling? Yeah, I don't know if you'd call it a dream or a nightmare. It depends on who you're talking <laughs> to, and I think for him, for him it'll be a nightmare considering it's a Texas Death Match. I think he made a bad choice when he came in and decided to challenge me. Uh, for my championship um, in a Texas death match, you know, so it's going to be interesting. It's going to be fun for the fans, not so much John Moxley, but for me and the fans, we're going to have a damn good time watching me destroy. Now, um, the way you, the circumstances you won the title mm -hmm. uh, with, uh, with that event where the, the title was vacated, you won the vacant title in that match with Juice Robinson. Mm -hmm. Did a part of you ever hope that man? I kind of hope John Moxley comes back and challenges me for this title, and I'll and I'll get to show him, you know, wh what a real champion is. <laughs> you know, for me, it was just a situation where, um, like you said, you know, it, it came about. It was kind of put into my lap, and I took advantage of the situation and became the U.S. champion. Um, as far as who the next challenger was, you know, ultimately it was uh, David Finley, and you know, he like everybody else died. Uh, metaphorically in the wrestling world in a sense. Um, you know, and as far as John's concerned, you know, hell, if he wanted to try to come back and challenge me, I was game for it. If it was somebody else, and you know, that was game for that too. So, you know, I wasn't one where I was like thinking, oh man, I hope John comes and challenges me. I was just hoping to keep going, moving forward and kicking some ass. Uh, no one would probably accuse John Moxley of being uh, mentally stable. Um, does that make this match infinitely more dangerous? For him, not me. Now, are do you have to plan out? Like, I mean, Moxley, he can, he can, he like, he likes tables, he likes hardcore, right. no DQ matches. So, do right. you think he might try to do something insane to really just sort of, uh, I mean, because look, this is no pinfalls. The only right. way for you guys to win is, um, not it, uh, according to the rules from New Japan, it's by knockout. Right. Uh, submission or, or who doesn't answer the 10 count. So, right. I mean, that's a very unique set of rules. So, I mean, are you concerned at all? Like, he might try something really insane here. I mean, he can try whatever he wants. Like I said, you know, knockout works for me, and I'll just knock him out, and he won't get up for a 10 count. So it works on both matters. What do you think when he says things that, like, he lost his title due to Delta Airlines? What do you, what do you have to say in response to that? Uh, Boo-hoo. Um, Lance, this, this year has been an incredible year, uh, for you. I mean, you, you've had a, a long and hard career. Uh, I mean, I followed your career for, you know, the better part of a decade and a half, you know, you know, going back to the days in TNA. So it's, it's really, it's just, it's kind of special. You know, I feel like you've always worked at a high level, you know, a guy of your size and you work this, you know, really fast paced athletic style, but to see, I feel like it's. It's taken a while, but I feel like things have finally come to fruition for you. But how do you feel? 
Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of on the same boat with you, man. You know, it, it's always been one of those things where I never stepped out the ring and I've never not given 100% or more. Um, you know, it's just I was in a situation and, you know, my focus was tag team wrestling for a long time and KES was going around killing it. We were, you know, three-time IWGP tag team champions. We were two-time NOAA GAC champions. We were two-time NWA world tag team champions. So, you know, I was just doing a lot of things and, <laughs> the singles run that has kind of come about in this last year, you know, starting, you know, right before the G1 and really the G1 is what kind of set everything apart. Um, it, it's just a highlight situation. Whereas before, you know, Smith and I were singing as a team and that was a good thing. There was nothing bad about it, but now in a singles capacity and, you know, with the G1, you know, I don't think anybody knew what to expect or what they were going to get. And, you know, maybe they kind of expected a little bit of the same of who I was just, you know, and, and what they think they, what they think they knew of me, uh, for the last eight years with new Japan. And, you know, I just did everything I could to kind of flip the script and change the game. And like I said, changing my stars, you know, changing my image, adding <laughs> some new moves and elements to my style of fighting and, and just trying to amp up the intensity in every way that I possibly could. And, you know, it's, it's worked. It's put me in positions. Like I said, you know, the, the situation where the title is vacated and, and they needed a challenger because that's how New Japan does. They advertise a title match. You're going to get a title match. Uh, Delta, Delta be damned. Um, you know, and that's kind of what happened. And, you know, I, I took down juice in a no DQ match and, and I'll take down John Moxley at the uh, Tokyo Dome in a Texas death match. Now let's go back to right before the G1 sort of New Japan was sort of in sort of an interesting situation. A lot of the, you know, the top guys who were sort of becoming, the backbone of New Japan at the time were kind of going away. I mean, Kenny Omega, the Young Bucks, they left the company and, uh, you know, they started their own promotion, AEW. And I felt like there was sort of, there was a bit of a talent void at the top. Um, of course, you know, you were teaming with uh, with uh, David Boy Smith Jr. for a little while with the Killer Elite Squad. He was no longer in the company either. Did you, did you, did you almost kind of feel like, man... I have to step up now or was there a fire lit under you? Cause I feel like this year sort of, I don't know, man, it, it, like you broke out this year and, and mm -hmm. it's like a, it's almost like a, a, a switch was flipped and you know, I feel, I feel like there, there were openings and I feel like you cap, mm -hmm. you capitalized on it and I think you did a great job, but I mean like, were you, were you looking at these things or did that, was it all just coincidental? I'm just curious how you see all, how all that panned out. Well, the opportunities to a degree kind of are coincidental, but that's just how this business works many, many times, you know, um, uh, it doesn't matter what company you're looking at guys come and go injuries happen. Opportunities are presented and, uh, you know, not everything goes to plan, whether it's the company's plan or the wrestler's plan or, or the business's plan, however you want to see it, you know, and the fans kind of see things, and they don't know, you know, what's going on in the inner workings and they don't know exactly what's going to happen at each given moment. And like I said, sometimes we don't know what's going to happen at each given moment, you know, and, <clears throat> you know, with, with AEW starting up and like you said, a, a large chunk of guys that were kind of on the top spot in New Japan going away, that opened up a lot of doors. And then the whole situation where Smith and I um, went our separate ways, Smith, you know, is being very successful right now at MLW. Um, and then, you know, an opportunity was presented because from my understanding, as far as the G1 is concerned, I initially wasn't a part of the G1 roster. Um, and then something happened, something changed. I still don't even know what that was. And I was included into it. So like you said, a fire was lit under me. It was definitely a, uh, this is my opportunity. It's a do or die moment. It's either possibly just exist in New Japan. Um, kind of under the idea of what I was, or I do something new, I do something different, I do something big, and try to make a new story, start a new story, and start a new chapter um, in, in my time in Japan and my career altogether. And that's what the G1 provided because, you know, to this day, the G1 climax is still in all of professional wrestling. I don't care what company you're watching or whatnot, it's the biggest singles tournament in all of professional wrestling right now. Um, so it was a prime, prime opportunity on a big stage level. And, you know, the world of professional wrestling fans were watching. Um, and it, I just saw it as my opportunity, like I said. And that's why I did everything I could to transform myself into the murder hawk monster. You know, I changed my hair. I changed my style, my gear. 
uh, like I said, I changed kind of my mindset and how I approached my matches. I changed, you know, and added, you know, new elements to the, my fighting, every, every aspect that I could possibly think of to try to change up a little bit without abandoning who I was and what I was all about. Um, I, I did it. And, you know, like you said, you know, it's kind of reinvigorated and reinvented me to the wrestling world. And, and it's been a good run and a lot of good things have come and opportunities, you know, keep landing in my lap and all I'm trying to do is knock them out of the park. Like I said, uh, the situation where Moxley couldn't show up to Japan uh, in October and uh, the, the situation was presented to me, the opportunity was put in front of me and I just chose to make the most of it. And I did, you know, and right now I'm, like I said, I'm the IWGP U S heavyweight champion and I'm going to the Tokyo dome for my first singles match in the Tokyo dome title defense and against John Moxley. Now, I mean, you know, the key to, I think, longevity in wrestling is reinventing yourself, and I think that's something you totally get. But did this year almost feel like a, a clean slate for you, Lance? Um, it, it's not necessarily a clean slate, you know. I mean, I, I think people still know your history. People still know what you're all about. Um, I, people have preconceived notions of what they think you're about, and the idea, like you said, in the idea of reinvention is to do things that surprise people in a way that makes them kind of negate what they thought you were and start to build a new idea of who they think you are now and what you may possibly be in the future. And you do it for yourself in the same sense. You know, um, I knew who I was. I knew what I could do. And I, like I said, I just I took every opportunity that was present in front of me and did everything I could to change my game, to change the game, and, and really create a whole new opportunity. And whether or not you want to call that a clean slate, it wasn't a clean slate necessarily. It was right. just opportunities put in front of me, and I capitalized on them the best way I could. Now, the G1 Climax, you know, they say pressure makes diamonds, and you definitely mm -hmm. shined in the, in the G1 Climax. So we started off, uh, we're in Dallas, Texas, so, you know, we're in your yeah. home state, hometown. your hometown, and you get to wrestle mm -hmm. Will Ospreay, who's, you know, at that point, he's probably the more established singles guy. Even though he's a junior heavyweight, he's a hot. And, uh, uh, you I know, agree. Will Ospreay, he's had a very hot year as well. And, man, that match yep. was, between you two, was an, was an eye-opener. Um, how did that night feel? Did it feel different to you? Because, I mean, that match was, I mean, that was a, that was a classic match. And I feel like that match sort of just symbolized that, I mean, you're here and every, and as you said, everyone dies and you're going to take down everyone's heroes and <laughs> you're not taking any more prisoners. It felt different. This felt, I mean, you know, I've watched you before, but this felt like a different Lance Archer and things right. were going to be different this time. And that match sort of really, I feel like set the tone and, you know, set the page, so to speak, uh, you know, and sort of represented, right. I think, how this year went for you. Yeah, absolutely. And like I said, I saw it as here's a starting point. Um, here is either come out and kind of be what everybody thought I was going to be, um, which, you know, nobody, I think, had any real complaints. It was just, you know, I was a solid big man, as some people might describe me. But this was a prime opportunity to start anew, to, to, to surprise people, to make them stand up and watch and pay attention. And like you said, going into the ring, with Will Ospreay, who, you know, Will and I had a really good match uh, back in the New Japan Cup in March. And it was one of those matches that kind of for the New Japan office and even the fans and everyone kind of went, wait a second. OK, so Lance Archer, the guy who's been here for this long, you know, completely different style and physicality and so on and so forth can can kind of keep up with that 2019 style. And I think what, you know, Will and I were able to do in March and then even more so in a uh, uh, July at the American Airlines Center in Dallas, Texas, which was really special for me because, like you said, it's in my home state. It's in my hometown. My family and friends were like, uh, you know, the, the arena had many, many friends in the arena, but my family and friends that I personally, you know, brought to the show were like four rows back. You know, my nieces that are, you know, nine, seven, and six, you know, being able to watch me in this American Airlines Center. And, you know, the pressure was on, but it was a lot of, it was a pressure that I wanted. And, um, you know, I think that Will and I were able to go out there and tell a very modern version of that old school David versus Goliath story. You know, it wasn't, you know, just big monster beats up little guy and little guy gets nothing. It was very active. It was very, uh, you know, 
to what other people said, very entertaining, uh, very fast paced. And it, like I said, it was very much a modern version of that old school story. But to even be able to finish that match, to win that match with what is one of the most classic wrestling holds in all of professional wrestling, the claw uh, in 2019 in an era of, you know, just amazing acrobatic and athletic feats that are uh, presented to the fans each and every night, depending on the promotion you're watching to be able to win that match in Dallas, Texas with the claw was, it made it even more special. And I think that's kind of what added to the unique awesomeness of that match. But because like I said, we had all the elements, I think that a 2019 wrestling audience wants to see. We had that old school David versus Goliath story existing within that realm. Um, there was fast pace athleticism on both sides from him, obviously. And then from me, like I said, people kind of going, wow, Lance is not just a tall, big guy that doesn't move. And then, like I said, to do the things we did and then to win the match with a claw or the EBD claw, as I call it. Um, it I just think it, it, it made a story with a lot of amazing action and it really connected with people in 2019 because it was not only cool in what they were watching, but the emotional side, the story side of it matched as well. And I think that's what made it special for myself and for the fans and for everybody that, you know, were paying attention. Uh, I mean, th what you're talking about, I think it's a big reason I, I gravitate toward the New Japan product because mm -hmm. people debate a lot about, you know, you know storyline characters, storytelling and wrestling mm -hmm. versus athleticism, move sets, what have you, work rate and all those things. I feel like mm -hmm. New Japan... You guys have the storytelling, you have the characters, you have the promos. I think in New right. Japan, it's just a very straightforward, very unique style that I think fans who are conditioned to the WWE or what have you just aren't used to. And I feel like you guys mm -hmm. have, like, you and you and Juice Robinson, just for example, you cut some fantastic promos, but they're just very natural you know, promos where I feel like you, you know, it's, it's you guys and it's your characters, mm -hmm. but you're, you're amplified a little more, but mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I believe, I be, like when you, when you're talking like everyone dies, I believe it. Mm -hmm. When Juice Robinson <laughs> is like on the verge of tears and he gets so emotional, like I believe it, like, but what do you think what? of that style that I, I think it's just a more straightforward style. And, and, and I feel like you guys have the storytelling. Right. And, I mean, I, I agree in that sense that I, I think the good combination that exists in New Japan, you know, it, it's it's one of those things that more and more people around the world are getting to see. Um, but, you know, it, it's a simple story. You know, it's very sport oriented. Um, you know, there's a lot of uh, it's who's the champion, who's the challenger. We're talking about the G1. It's every man for themselves. And we're all gunning for one spot because ultimately that one spot leads to the main event of the Tokyo Dome. Um, you know, so it's a very simple story, like I said, in a sports oriented story that people can follow. Um, and then, you know, there, there's not a lot of restrictions and all people are allowed to be who they want to be and how they are as far as on a character base and an emotional base and things like that. You know, whereas, you know, and I'm not talking bad about any company, but, you know, if, if you want to compare things, you know, where it's WWE is extremely story oriented you know the wrestling seems to be kind of a, a second wave to everything that is produced the story is the main point whereas you know there are some other independents and things like that that are just it, it's only about the wrestling it's only about you know the athleticism it's, it's only about the spots and the moments in that sense um and new japan does a good job of combining those two things we have good solid simple strong stories but then we have amazing fast-paced athletic you know 2019 wrestling that are combined together and i think those two combinations of things kind of creates a very conducive company for the now and future of this business now before this you know this current run you're having i mean you and um davy boy smith jr or, or harry smith you guys had quite mm -hmm. the run together as a tag team as mm -hmm. the killer elite squad and you guys were right. a very successful tag team held multiple tag team titles and multiple organizations what did you think of uh, of Davy Boy as a tag team partner, and you know, traveling with him, working with him? How did you like, you know, the time you guys got to share together in wrestling? Well, I mean, like you said, the accolades I think speak for themselves, and the fact that we were such a big, strong, dominant 
a uh, hybrid version of big man T, you know, with, with his technical skills and his catch wrestling background and things of that nature. And you had, you know, my intensity and brute force and, and attack version, you know, whatever you want to call it, that combination, especially as big as we were, worked really well together. Um, you know, like I said, the accolades of three time IWGP, two time Noah GAC, two time NWA world tag team champions, uh, that helps speak for itself. So, you know, you know, Smith and I were extremely different people, you know, it was outside the ring, but we always got along in the sense that, you know, we understood that, you know, the more conducive we were together inside the ring, the more successful the team could be. And, you know, it worked really well for a really long time. Um, you know, everything runs its course and it was just a kind of a situation, like I said, that he decided he wanted to go do something else. Um, you know, now he's doing, like I said, extremely well in MLW. Um, opportunities have been presented and I've done, like I said, my part in every way that I possibly could to capitalize on those situations in New Japan. And uh, right now, I think we're both being very successful as singles competitors. You know, it wasn't a situation um, where anything negative happened between he and I. You know, there was never a breakup of him and I. It was just a, you know, business decisions were made and, and we went different ways. That's all. Now, I... This was uh th- this was something I actually didn't know about. How did you two get paired up? I'm just curious how that happened. Were you two friendly beforehand? Uh, did someone come up with the idea to pair you up together as a tag team? Well, yeah, um, the, the, you know, the company decided to put us together. You know, it was one of those situations where I've been with New Japan uh, since June of 2011. Um, Smith had he'd worked New Japan back in 2005, before, you know, when he was really young and before any of his WWE stuff. Um, you know, and then they were wanting to bring him in for a little while. And then, uh, I believe September of 2012 was when he came to the company and that's when KES was born. You know, I was already part of Suzuki Gun for more than a year at that point. Um, had teamed with Suzuki and, you know, we actually won the tag league my first year I was with New Japan. Um, but now that they brought Smith in and they paired us together and Smith and I, you know, came together and created the name Killer Elite Squad, so on and so forth. Um, and it, like I said, we were, we, it wasn't a situation where it was an idea that we pitched or anything like that. Um, it was a situation where the company put us together and, you know, we did everything we could to make it successful. And I, I would like to say, I think we did pretty damn good. Um, I first started watching you back in the, in the TNA days and ye old TNA. Now it's impact mm-hmm. wrestling. I, I mm-hmm. guess what, what's sort of the big takeaway for you in your career, uh, from TNA? The big takeaway on a personal level, yeah. or are you talking about for like you know, professionally? Just you know, from your you know your career and on a personal level. You know, I, I mean, everything we do in this business is a learning experience. You know, and I was lucky enough to be a part of TNA at a time when it was growing. Um, you know, I'd only spent about four years on the independent scene here in Texas uh, when I got my first opportunity with TNA back in March of two thousand four. Um, you know, and like I said, when I started with TNA, we were still just doing the Wednesday night pay-per-views. And then we went on to the Fox Sports Network Friday shows. And then, you know, things moved along and we joined Spike Network and we started doing the traditional three-hour pay-per-views. And, you know, everything was uh, a new and a first for the company. And I was there and a part of a lot of that, you know, had three different names while I was there. It started out as Dallas. Then I worked as Lance Hoyt for a while. And then finished up with, you know, teaming with Jimmy Rave in the Rock and Rave Infection uh, as Lance Rock. And so the things that I took away from it was just the learning experience altogether, you know, kind of learning the business on a bigger level, dealing with people who had been in the business for a long time and had, you know, kind of ideas of how wrestling should be. And, you know, even in 2004 you know, to 2009, it was a business that was changing and growing at its time. You know, the X Division became a huge deal. And, you know, the X Division is kind of the, the birthplace of the modern wrestling that exists now and so on and so forth. So, you know, it was just, it was, like I said, always a learning experience, learning from different people and different mentalities and different ideas, you know, learning the business from a business standpoint, you know, because the independents are very simple in that aspect. It's, you know, here's here's how much I want, and that's how much they pay you for the one show, and you come in and they hand you an envelope or whatever it is, you know, and you do your thing and you go home. And, and whereas working with TNA, you're under actual contracts and, you know, it's, it's, a, it's paychecks and so on and so forth, and you know, it's very official and whatnot. So learning that side of the business is, is kind of where I got my feet wet with TNA. And, you know, that helped me in, in my moving on to WWE and it's helped me tremendously in my, uh, 
years with New Japan. So it's one of those things where a lot of learning happened while I was at TNA. Because like I said, I was four years into the business when I got my contract with TNA. So I was extremely young and extremely green. You know, it was my first, you know, under my first 10 years of my bit, my time in the business. So, you know, it's one of those things where uh, it was a lot of fun, made a lot of good friends, still friends with a lot of the guys that are being extremely successful today. Um, you know, and it's cool to see where all of them have gone and, and myself as well. Uh, now, was TNA, with all the, you know, reg- regime changes and everything, was it as chaotic as the dirt sheets would report and indicate, or was it, was all that exaggerated? <laughs> as the dirt sheets always are, it, it's more exaggerated than right. it is. I mean, there are, there are, there are some things that, you know, even the dirt sheets don't know about that happened and, and, and the things that people went through and so on and so forth. Um, but for the most part, a lot of the stuff, you know, you know, whether you love him or hate him, Vince Russo got a lot of, uh, credit and bad credit for ideas that weren't his and some that were, you know, it was one of those things where a a lot of ideas and a lot of things that happened on TV, he got blamed for, and they weren't even his creation. They weren't his idea. Um, So, you know, the dirt sheets and and the fans that don't know any better at the time, you know, are blaming somebody that had nothing to do with it. So it's one of those things where, you know, the dirt sheets, anytime I read something on the dirt sheets, you know, it's one of those things, just like fans, you know, I read them and I go, Oh man, is this true? Because if so, it's, so bad but then again i knowing my time in the business and what has been true and what's not been true and what's been blown out of proportion um most of the time i just kind of look at it with a grain of salt and realize maybe there's a grain of truth to that that, but there's probably a reality that most people don't even know about well you saved me the trouble of having to ask you about vince uh russo but was dixie (laughs) carter generally a good boss was she a reliable boss and a good you know a person you know you could deal with at least for me yeah he was he was very supportive of me you know I, he was a fan of me and my work and you know he actually gave me several opportunities um in different capacities um you know the one story i tell is that you know he put me with uh truth long true killings because i could dance he could stop me in the hallway one day and he's like bro i heard you can dance and i was like yeah i can dance and he goes bro you gotta dance and I was like, okay. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, and then he put Truth and I together. And for a while there, I was dancing Lance on TNA TV. Uh, but what about Dixie Carter uh, as a boss and her and just her general, you know, acumen as a boss? Um, for me, again, I, I, I didn't have a bad relationship with anyone. Okay. Um, you, you know, the, everybody's, my relationship with the different people ranged in different ways. Um, you know, Dixie was always very nice to me. We never had like any long Depth, in-depth conversations about anything, but all of our interactions were short, sweet, and, and, and very cordial. Um, you know, it doesn't matter who you, Dutch Mantel was you know, a really influential person for me, especially early on in my TNA days, and he helped me a lot with the ideas in psychology, and um, I mean, the list goes on and on. Scott DeMore, who, uh, who is still with Impact today, you know, has come and gone a, a few times, and he's controlled the book a, a few different times. Uh, was very honest and very blunt with me on certain things, which I appreciated because it helped me understand and focus and move forward. You know, whereas a lot of people um, in today's society don't like hearing very blunt and straightforward replies and answers to things because they get their feelings hurt. And, you know, I did get my feelings hurt, but to the point of going, okay, now I know what I need to do to fix things. And I did that. And, And I appreciate that. So, you know, um, again, it was never a bad situation and he helped me out tremendously in many, many, many different ways. Uh, and that was one of them, you know, so there's a lot of, um, different relationships with the different people that are running the companies at different times. Dusty Rhodes, who, who was a big supporter of mine while at TNA helped me out luckily enough to get to wrestling one time in Nashville. And, um, you know, he helped me get my job at WWE, you know, so there's, good relationships have helped me advance my career as much or more than anything in this business. Uh, I liked uh, the rock and rave infection with, with Jimmy Rave. <laughs> Did you like the rock and rave inf- infection? I always felt, you know, they could have d- maybe done a little more with that, with that uh, group. Oh yeah. They, I, I'm, I agree with you. Absolutely. fully. They, they could have done so much more with that, but you know, it is what it is. We had a little bit of fun. The fans seemed to enjoy it. And you know, it, it ultimately it was, it was what it was. 
Uh, now you did uh, get to have some time in uh, in WWE. What was what was that like for you when you know finding yourself in in uh, WWE in that point in your career? Um, you know, yeah, you know, it was it was, a, it was an amazing opportunity. You know, going almost directly from TNA into the WWE system. You know, FCW at the time uh, was their developmental there in Tampa, Florida. Um, and, and again learning experiences were always good. You know, I mean, down at FCW, uh, like I said, Dusty Rhodes was there, and he was one of the reasons I got my job. Dr. Tom Pritchard, Steve Kern, Norman Smiley, um, so many different people that came in and out of there. Um, you know, uh, 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 Fit Finley came down there so many times, and he helped me tremendously. Arn Anderson, you know, uh, Billy Kidman was down there periodically until he was on the road full time. You know, just so many different people that came in and out of there that helped out, and you know, that was their job, and they were really good at it, and they helped me advance pretty quickly because within six months I was put on ECW television before ECW became the original NXT, um, and even that time was good, but you know, it's a very uh, 2009, 2010, in my opinion, was a very hard time to be in the business or or in WWE because there was there was no competition really for WWE. You know, yes, TNA existed and yes, it was there, but it wasn't in any sense. The business wasn't what it was. The independents weren't as strong and visible as they are today. Um, you know, New Japan existed in Japan, but not over here. Um, so they didn't really have any reason to do anything different. And you know, you had. Linda, who was trying to be part of the the Congress or Senate, whichever she was running for, um, you know, so they were very, very strict on, you know, what could and couldn't be done on TV. You know, we had an extremely strict no blood policy would absolutely stop every single thing for any trickle of blood, um, even if it was accidental. And, and you know, we just made things very difficult to, to work there in that sense. Um, my time there was very short. It wasn't very successful, but I made a lot of good friends. I've learned a ton, got to travel around the country in the world a bit, got to wrestle at WrestleMania, even though it was just a pre-show that world, I still got to put my boots on and walk down that ramp and have that experience. So in the big picture of things, there's really nothing negative that I could say about it. No, it just wasn't a very successful run. I think one of the coolest and most underrated matches of your career is probably, I think it was 2005, I think it was Sacrifice. You had this one-on-one -on -one match with Abyss that I just think was right. just this really cool badass match. Do you remember that match? And I think it was absolutely just <laughs> like I wish people would like talk about because I I feel like you guys just did something very exciting and, and unique, especially you know with two guys of your size. Yeah, when if anyone asked you know what my favorite memories or memory of TNA time was or favorite match I ever had. That's my favorite. You know, Abyss and I always had an amazing chemistry. Two extremely large guys that could move very well. Um, we did some really fun and cool stuff. Um, hell, I hit a springboard Van Terminator in that match, something I, <laughs> that I'll probably never do again. But the fact that it happened and it was there was really cool. The fans lost their minds when it happened. Um, you know, so it, it had a lot of really cool and fun elements. And, you know, it was one of those moments that, kind of helped make me at TNA if they had to capitalize on it a little more. But, you know, it, they didn't, and it is what it is. But, like, that's kind of a moment that sticks out in my mind where, like, yeah, like, like I feel like I saw something there. And now right. I feel Thank like you. all these – here we are almost 15 years later after that match, and, like, mm -hmm. and I'm, like, like, I'm just – it makes me happy to see, like, you are where you are right now because, like, I feel like if anyone had – if anyone, you know, we hear the term paying their dues in this business a lot. If anyone has paid their dues in this business, and then some, Lance, I feel like it's you. Oh, well, thank you. Um, now, going to the murder hawk, you know, the murder hawk thing, is this, do you feel like this is you, you know, dialed up to 11 um, at all? Or, or I, I'm, I guess I'm just curious about the whole murder hawk thing. In your own words. Well, let, let, let's get let, let's get it right. First off, it's called the Murder Hawk Monster, not just the Murder Hawk. Murder Hawk Monster. I'm sorry. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, the Murder Hawk is, is the hairstyle, but I just call the whole the whole personality and the whole persona uh, the Murder Hawk Monster. You know, I was doing the American Psycho for a long time, and I just felt like part of the change and the new me had to have a new moniker. And like I said, the Murder Hawk Monster is, is kind of where it's been. 
Um, and yeah, it, it definitely plays into my, the idea of who I want people to see when I come to the ring, you know, from the, from the get go, you know, the music plays and I come storming out of the, the curtain and I, I start destroying young lions before I even step in the ring. And then, you know, just, you know, how I attack each opponent, you know, and, and try to make sure that it's, it's a fast hit, hard hitting, high flying, crazy cool match every single time I'm out there, especially when it's in a single situation. Now, do you wrestlers ever feel like, you know, you have a chip on your shoulder and may, but maybe use that sort of, I guess, emotion and channel it into the ring or into the character? I'm sorry, say that again, please. Like, do you, do you think you or other wrestlers ever feel like, you know, you have a chip on your shoulder and then, but maybe kind of try to use that emotion and try to channel it into your work, like in the ring or with the promos? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think it's one of those, it, it's an emotionally driven business that's trying to draw an emotional reaction out of its fan base. And I think that's part of it. And the people who have the biggest, strongest characters, whether you're being a, a comedian or whether you're being a monster, whether you're being an athlete, whether you're being a team uh, or whatever the case may be, um, uh, the, those kind of those chips on the shoulders, those emotional responses and actions and reactions are what kind of fuel this business altogether. And I think the ones who become the biggest stars in this business are the ones who can kind of capture that. Um, so, you know, I take any and all opportunities, like I said, you know, going into the G1, when I found out I was in the G1, it was a do or die moment. It was a adapt or die situation. It was a, you know, I, I, I've had a long career people see me as what they think I am and here's my opportunity. And if I don't do something now, then I will be lost forever. And so I kind of take that emotional draw, um, like you said, kind of a chip on my shoulder and say, I don't care what they thought I was. I'm going to do something special and new and now so they can change their minds and start to understand who I am and who I'm going to be. Now, I mean, when I think about all the major wrestling events that are going to be coming up uh, early next year, mm -hmm. I think Wrestle Kingdom is really mm -hmm. what I'm most excited about, and I think this matchup with Moxley is a big part of that. I guess what do you cool. what do you think that you know you, you know you're a part of wrestling and, and just sort of this new wave where people have alternatives and people can watch different types of wrestling just sort of mm -hmm. at a high level like this, and what you think about that. I think it's amazing. Like I said, I think this is the hottest time in all of professional wrestling for the simple fact, like you said, there are so many options, so many high level options. Um, you know, obviously internet and internet streaming has kind of changed that game. Um, it's made wrestling around the world accessible for the fans and the true hardcore fans. Um, and even the kind of in general fans are starting to get more and more options. Like I said, WWE TV, uh, obviously, they're all over the place with the USA Networks on Monday and Wednesday and then Fox on Friday. Um, and then now AEW on TNT, you know, a return, to, a return to TNT, you know, from the old WCW days. Now wrestling's back on TNT and they're doing extremely well. Um, you know, Impact is back on, on, a, on a more visible television program with access to TVs. New Japan's on access TV. Um, so uh, as far as just if you want to turn your TV on, you can find so much wrestling right now. And then we talk about all the streaming platforms and the ability of independents to produce fairly high-level streaming programs, whether it's on the a Fight Network or Twitch or whatever the case may be, um, as long as you have a, a good enough streaming company with a good camera work and good you know production uh, equipment, you can actually produce a very high quality independent wrestling show that's very easily accessible and sometimes and many times free to wrestling fans around the world. And with the right publicity, people are going to watch and pay attention. Um, so it presents to the wrestling fan many different choices in many different styles from many different areas around the world. And, and basically at any time they want to watch pro wrestling. And then for the wrestlers, it provides a lot of opportunity to be seen and to learn their craft, to hone their craft, to become better, to find themselves and to kind of present themselves to the wrestling world. You know, some guys and girls catch that internet fire. You know, there's a kid right now, his name's Alex Zane and he's over in Japan right now not with New Japan, but working some other companies, but he's on New Japan's radar. He worked at the LA show we did just not too long ago. 
<clears throat> and I wouldn't be surprised if he shows up on some more. And he's one of those top indie hot commodities. He's wrestled at PWG uh, several times, I think, now. And, 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 you know, it's one of those things where the Internet is helping people become visible to the point where everybody starts paying attention. Um, and then the bigger companies start paying attention. And then they want you a part of their, their product and whatnot. So <laughs> that's why I say, in my opinion, it's the hottest time in all of professional wrestling. I know there's a an affinity towards the old, you know, Monday Night Wars, WCW versus WWF back in the day, the DX versus NWO, and that stuff was amazing. But it was just two companies on major levels competing against each other. Right now we have several major companies competing with and against each other on major network television in the U.S., and you're competing with high-level independents around the world um, you know, that are competing on uh, internet streaming services. So it's just it's in a cool, amazing, Wild West time of professional wrestling. Uh, just a couple more things, Lance, and uh, then I'll let you go. Uh, if John Moxley no was standing next to us um, right about now, would you have a message for uh -huh. him? Sure, John, get yourself ready because you're going to step in the ring with somebody that you have no idea what I'm about. You, you've been around the world. You've wrestled some of the biggest names in this business. You're a crazy son of a bitch, but you've never stepped in the ring with me. And once we get done, you'll wish you never stepped in the ring with me because I'm the murder hawk monster. I'm the one you should be afraid of. And I'm walking out of the Tokyo Dome, the U.S. champion. Now, a a after you walk out of the Texas death match, the next night... Mm -hmm. Night two at the Tokyo Dome, it's Juice Robinson. Do you Poor think, Juice. considering you've already beaten him, does right. he even deserve this title shot to be in a title match at the Tokyo Dome? I think everybody deserves a chance. Okay. And he deserves a chance. He, he, brought, he brought it to me. I'm not going to sit here and say that it was easy by any means to take down Juice Robinson. Um, you know, he's, he's going to have his own big title match in, on night one in the, the tag team title match because him and Finley won the tag league in their face in G.O.D. And he could walk out a tag team champion on night one and then he'll have to step in the ring with me. Um, you know, and it's one of those things that it's kind of a double edged sword in the sense that we've already worked. We've already wrestled. Um, we're both going to probably be battered and bruised from our matches on night one. Um, he knows me probably better than John does. You know, John stepping in the ring with me for the very first time. Uh, uh, Juice and I have stepped in the ring several times, both in tag matches, single situations, and title matches. So Juice, in a sense, kind of has an edge over John because he knows me. But in my opinion, it still won't matter. It's one of those things where I am so driven and I am so ready to go into both nights and kick both their asses and then just leave Tokyo still the champion. Now, you're from Texas. I, I'm actually mm -hmm. also from Texas. I grew up in Texas. Um, All right. If you have one, do you have a favorite Texas barbecue? Texas barbecue? Yes. No, not, you know, okay. I can't sit here and say anything specific. You know, there's, uh, there's a place down in Green, Texas that's pretty good. And, um, you know, the salt grass is pretty good okay. and stuff of that nature. I mean, so there's a lot of them. It's, it's hard to say. My own barbecue, the ones I do okay. in my house where I'm, I cook it and I get to watch it, you know, my television and chill and relax. That's that's my favorite barbecue. So you're, you're, your own barbecue. That's okay. That You know, some people say that. So that's... Uh, Damn right. <laughs> <laughs> that's also fine. And just last thing, um, if you have any, any plugs, uh, any, uh, you know, any social platforms where people can find you, uh, the floor is yours. And anything you'd like to share with uh, our listeners. Yeah, you know, uh, just first and foremost, I want to thank all the fans because without the fans, there is no wrestling and they are the lifeblood of this business. So, you know, I used to say back in the day when I felt like the fan base was extremely negative about everything and there's still a lot of negativity out there. I think it's a lot more positive today and I think that's part of the reason the business is thriving so well. So I want to say thank you to the fans for supporting wrestling as much as they do. Just keep doing it even more, supporting it more. Stop being so negative about anything and just enjoy what you can find that you like um as far as finding me on social platforms you know at lance hoyt uh on twitter uh lance underscore hoyt on instagram um and just lance hoyt i keep everything under my real name uh, on facebook and like i said if you want to send me a message shoot me a message if you say something cool i'll probably answer you back if you say something stupid you won't hear from me at all all right he is lance archer he is the murder hawk monster john moxley the Tokyo Dome, Wrestle Kingdom 14, January 4th and 5th. It'll be streaming on Fight TV. Uh, Lance, thank you so much, man. I really uh, appreciate this time. This has been one of my favorite interviews ever, so thank you. 
Awesome. And it'll be on Fight TV, but it's also, in, uh, and most importantly, oh, it's on New Japan and New World. Japan World. I'm so, yeah. So you can also <laughs> get that on New Japan World. And just remember, everybody dies. He just has to be last. Damn right. Thank you. This is Jeffrey Harris, and you've been listening to Lance Archer on the 411 Wrestling Interviews Podcast. Thank you.